Hello all you fine folk, welcome to another Old World Almanac, another Old World Update video. As the Games Workshop have been putting out several articles over the past few days, which is a little bit more than I can keep up with, so I'm going to cram a few of them into this episode. I'm not going to discuss all of them because they're not all going to be very relevant. But I do want to mention them all and I will of course also put the links to each and every one of these articles in the video description so that you can check them out for yourselves. So let's start with um, not the first but actually the last of these articles and that is which you probably already know that we have now finally we are finally able to order some Games Workshop articles some Warhammer articles. The pre-orders have been online since last Saturday and I believe they've also been more or less sold out, all of them. So uh, maybe your friendly local gaming store still has some of these items if you're interested in them. But otherwise you'll have to wait until they come back in stock. I have taken my opportunity to order a few of the books. I did not get the rule book because I found someone who got both the Tomb Kings and the Bretonia box and he agreed to sell me the rule book and uh, some of the accessories from one of them. So I'm going to wait for those. I did buy the other books, Forces of Fantasy, Ravening Hordes and the two Arcane Journals. I'm going to wait for a few of the miniatures. I'm definitely going to get some of the Bretonian Foot Knights at some point. I believe they are not yet out. And yeah, other than that, uh, the Herald Nakaf is, uh, well, it's not this one, but it's the other one. Uh, also, I guess not out yet, um, but there's also something that I want to get later on, some more Sepulchral Stalkers. These are not very high priority for me at the moment. I did plan on getting these uh, cards, but by the time I got onto the Games Workshop website, only two of the sets were still available. The Tomb King's Magic Items, I believe, and the Common Magic Items. And when I saw those prices, I thought, well, that's a, a bit much to pay for some uh, pieces of cardboard. So I'm probably not going to get those after all. Maybe if they get reprinted and uh, for sale at the local gaming store, I can, can get them at the discount. Same for the dice. I also wanted to get them, but seeing the prices, I thought, nah, that's uh, going to be a bit much so I'm going to skip out on that. So that's it for the pre-orders. Now let's take a look at some of the other articles. The first one is about Warhammer Plus. This is not going to be an article that I can comment very much upon because I've never seen the need to subscribe to Warhammer Plus. Most of it that was on there had something to do with either Age of Sigma or Warhammer 40k, both games that I don't play. Um, so yeah, maybe now that Warhammer the Old World is a thing, uh, it might be interesting to get a subscription to Warhammer Plus, but honestly I think I'd rather spend my hard-earned money on miniatures than on a subscription to a TV channel where we get some stuff that I probably won't have the time to watch anyway. So let's see what they put out on Warhammer Plus for those of you who might be interested in getting a subscription. So we get a battle report and in this battle report we get a few comments or in the description of the battle report we get a few comments from the players. Uh, they're calling it a trip down memory lane with ranked units once more in the game of Warhammer. If you are a little bit like me and you've played some of these older versions of the game before, then this trip down memory lane needn't have taken so long. And um, yeah, I can still play the old versions of the game. So I guess this trip down memory lane is something that you can still do and you don't have to wait for the old world to finally arrive. This wasn't just a game we remembered from 10 years ago, it was much better. That definitely piques my interest, I'd like to see what's so good about it. And they go on about the things that we've discussed earlier, such as the phases and sub-phases. Uh, it makes so much sense, no more confusion about when something happens. 
in my experience, the only confusion is when two things happen at the same time, such as both things happening at the two things happening both at the same time in the start of turn phase, which one takes priority? Things like uh, stupidity and animosity, for instance. And even then, it's very easy to resolve most of the time. If, when in doubt, just roll a die. Then we get the unit types. Uh, improved clarity. All units have been, all unit types have been clearly defined. I thought that was also the case in 8th edition, but still. Uh, we now have four categories of cavalry, they say. Light, heavy, monstrous, and war beast. Each one has their own specific rules, which means it's clearer. And crucially, each unit can act exactly how it's supposed to on the battlefield. Might also mean that it's a little bit more limiting, but uh, that's just my maybe overly negative brain. Um, I, I'm one of those guys that says, let's see how this goes first before I believe it. And uh, then we go on to armor piercing. We no longer have the armor priest piercing automatically. So high strength always a my minus uh, modifier. But now it's um, it's a it's a stat. It's a little bit more granular. I think that's a good thing. It also means that it me that, that we need to look up things a lot more, and that we can't automatically rely on uh, calculating armor piercing. And we just need to take in mind whether it is armor saves allowed, no armor saves allowed, or the old armor piercing rule at minus one armor save. Fallback in good order. That's an interesting mechanic that I'd love to see how that works. Because uh, as they say here in this article, it means that you don't run away as often as you used to. Uh, your glorious units will be on the tabletop longer, which means it's great if you spend hours painting them. There's also something fun to say for your freshly painted miniatures running off of the table uh, in the first turn that they are on the table of the first game. But yeah, I can imagine having your units on the table more. It will lead to... Um, probably longer battles in terms of... Your units will be on the table longer and therefore they will also um, be in the game longer and that means that your your games your game turns will last longer because the less units you have on the table the quicker a game turn progresses so i think this is something that might on the one hand leads to more interesting battles on the other hand it might also uh, lead to a lot more indecisive moments where uh, the outcome of a battle will more likely than not result in a draw. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but uh, that's something that we will have to see when we get the books and uh, how this works out. And they go on about the initiative. And uh, that's a good thing, I think. Initiative is a stat that was Highly undervalued in most editions of Warhammer Fantasy. Now you get the initiative bonus when charging up to three or four even in the flank or rear. And that means that you often uh, get the advantage of fighting first, but not always. And uh, the rest of them is all fought in initiative order. Uh, these are a few of the th favorite things that they have about Warhammer the Old World. And then there's another Warhammer Old World thing on the OnePlus channel or streaming service, whatever you want to call it, which is about the lore of Bretonia. Um, the, we cover the founding of the nation of Bretonia all the way up to the reign of King Lewin Orkslayer. And that will be interesting to see. But uh, yeah, so if you want to do that, there's a big subscribe now button. Which, for some reason, I cannot click at the moment, but uh, you can probably find another way to subscribe to Warhammer Plus. The next article is another Old World Almanac Designer Round Table, the second one of uh, four in total. We did the first one in the last video. And this one and the next one I'm going to go over a little bit quickly because the topic for this is the design and for the next one the painting of the miniatures 
And I think these topics don't really lend themselves very well to a YouTube video like this. Um, my channel is not so much dedicated to the miniatures and painting, but more to the rules and the lore. So I want to focus more on those articles. Nevertheless, I'm going to uh, glance over this article and give you my thoughts where applicable. So we start off by learning why, uh, where did we start with the new miniatures? And they say the Bretonians and Tomb Kings hadn't really been the stars of previous editions for a while, but as the community loves both, they felt a natural fit for return to the old world. In other words, those miniatures were the most expensive in the second hand market, and that's why we chose to put them out first. These and of course the 4th edition Chaos Dwarves, but uh, even though Chaos Dwarves are going to be a legacy army, more on that later, uh, I don't think we will see a return of the 4th edition miniatures, nor do I think we need them, because we've got some excellent sculptors that are continuing the Chaos Dwarf range in line with their 4th edition aesthetic. So... Um, yeah, uh, they go on about how they found a massive tone of tome of Bretonian concept art, background heraldry and stuff. I guess this is something that they planned to use for 8th edition. There were some rumors about uh, pallets full of Bretonian army books that were unsold after the Warhammer World crash in 8th edition. Those rumors have never been confirmed to my knowledge, but uh, yeah, it might be that they planned on doing Bretonia as one of the next armies before they decided to blow up the old world. So uh, that's where they took their style guide from. Um, so let's see here. Uh, the big desire with the Knights of the Realm on foot was finding specific teams that could be particular to Bretonia. So they talk a little bit about this new unit. They say things like... Uh, they put the locks on on there as part of the items and uh, that that's uh, symbolic for them locking themselves to their quest or to the lady um i think we'll read more about that in the army books or what, what are they going to call, be called again the arcane journals uh, then they also say that in the old world um Maybe it's not this article, but maybe another. But in the old world, then most of the armies were pretty flat. There was not much height difference. So they opted to go for a little bit bigger monsters. And so, so they got the Pegasus for the Bretonians and the Bone Dragon for the Tomb Kings to give those little height differences there. Is working on the world of legend different to working on other settings? Are there limits to what can be changed? They say they do want to stay in style with the previous aesthetic. It has to still be Warhammer, despite the techniques having in increased and there are less limits on what you can do compared to what it was back in the day of Warhammer. You uh, still are limited in, in a way by what the style of Warhammer is, so... Uh, it has to fit in with the style, and I think for what we've seen so far, they really managed to do that. Uh, has the iconography changed? Uh, art and iconography go hand in hand. So basically they say, we looked at examples of earlier iconography, and um, then they expanded and, and improved upon that. And uh, finally, another example of a shift in our approach is the fleur de lis that appears across the heraldry. A fairly generic heraldic device, but it has been made into one that's indisputably Bretonian with the inclusion of the sword in the middle and the sharper crescents. So I hadn't spotted that yet, but yeah, this new Fleur de Lis symbol, it does have a sword in the middle. Um, although over here, these are either these are old shields or these are just simply Fleur de Lis symbols where they didn't put in a sword. For me, I'm going with the old 5th edition aesthetic, where the Fleur de Lis is the symbol of the questing knight. So only questing knights and grail knights in my army have the Fleur de Lis symbol. And any other knights have their own heraldic symbols and their own heraldic devices. I hope that these new Bretonians, which are painted all in a scheme of their dukedom, 
uh, the, the painting scheme doesn't limit you what armies you can play because if it does so it would be a bit disappointing i don't want to um, paint a bretonian army in all the same heraldic colors i want them to be very uh, very much a mixed bag and i still want to be able to play a regular bretonian army with them not just have them relegated to a sort of crusader army or or an exile army what you get in those books but we'll have to wait i guess until the books arrive before we can make a judgment call on that and even if they say your army has to be painted a particular way i'm pretty sure that none of my opponents will have any problem with me having a very brightly colored and very varied Bretonian army. We also get something about the Tomb Kings. Um, they flesh that out a little bit more. They say uh, we, we want to have that skull symbol in there everywhere. We see some of the Nehekaran gods and goddesses represented uh, here, for example, with the asp and with uh, the, the scarab beetle. Um, this is the symbol of the mortuary cult. I don't know if you can see my my cursor here. There we go. Uh, so this this uh, eagle a vulture thingy is the symbol of the mortuary cult. That's also new. Um, th those symbols were not really assigned, as far as I know, back in sixth and eighth edition when the Tomb Kings got their two army books. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's something new as well. And I'm curious to see how this will work out and how you will, for example, have the different symbols of the different Tomb Kings or the different cities in Kara represented. On to the next article. Bretonian Knights of the Realm on foot painted by the Warhammer community. A painting article and although these do look very colorful and uh, this makes a very nice unit in a way that I like to see my own Bretonians as well. I don't really want to spend too much time on this article. Uh, pretty nights, pretty pictures and yeah the way that these are painted it, it fits more with a painting video or a painting channel than I would like to put out on my own podcast so if you're interested in that the link is in the description of the video speaking of painting videos the next article is another old world almanac designer roundtable this time on painting the miniatures and although we get some very pretty images of beautifully painted armies again an article that i don't really want to spend too much time on um there has been some changes since the last edition of Warhammer because, well, for example, now we have contrast paints, uh, new dig digital photography is much brighter and crisper, which means that things have to be painted to a different standard. Uh, sharper renders of the miniatures, it's heavier to focus on the detail. So uh, the, the painting style has changed a little bit. And they tried to, as far as I can gather, have a mix between what you can do with modern techniques as well as how to keep the old aesthetic. So, uh, are you trying to match old styles or are you pushing ahead as far as you can? We don't necessarily want to limit ourselves. We can treat something like a damsel as a statement of intent. A little bit like the designers did with the packed layout of the Knights of the Realm on foot. We then revisit the Bretonian future. We've laid this much stronger foundation for future work. This is an interesting picture here. I'm curious to see if this will be published in the um, the F F Forces of Fantasy or in the Arcane Journal. Uh, I'd love to see these painting uh, uh, schemes, um, painting recipes, and the Games Workshop have put out several books over the past few decades with how to paint Citadel miniatures and those are very uh, useful. If you can still get your hands on them, I can highly recommend them. 
Until that time, I hope that they will put this information in the books as well, or maybe on the website. Um, those painting recipes are a, a great help to yeah, well, get your stuff painted to a similar standard. I uh, love to see also here the old Warhammer Fortress. I hope that kit will make a return as well. You know, a lot of people would love to get their hands on one. I'm uh, fortunate enough that I was able to get one second hand at some point in the past. And if you've seen my recent Mortime video, then you've seen the the East Gate, the walls. They have they are made up of this old Warhammer Fortress. So um, yeah, they focus a little bit about on the new damsel. Uh, what's he called? The the prophetess, the Fey Enchantress. That's one. Too many names, too many terms for me to remember. I'm too old for that. Um, how are you going to make a model like this? And uh, even though she does look a little bit like a porcelain doll, I do think that this is a lovely miniature and a lovely paint job as well. Um, so they talk about how to do this. Uh, you have to... Uh, Put in a little bit of realism, uh, speckling and glazing a skin tone onto the muzzle. So uh, that's over here with uh, with the horse. That does add a little bit of realism. Those uh, flowers are also painted very nicely. It might be that you can do that simply with contrast paints nowadays. And same for her for her dress here that looks to be embossed and not uh, freehanded. Uh, how do you tackle the Tomb Kings of Camry and the Necklet Bone Dragon? Well, I guess the same way you do everything, and that's uh, lots of dry brushing. Um, so, yeah, they, they, there's not much you can do with it in terms of color because it's bone. But you can do, of course, some things with the details. They have gone here for a little bit more subdued color scheme. Uh, the, uh, this used to be a little bit more brighter turquoise in the early days of 6th uh, edition. A little bit more like this was over here, like this is over here. So, um, might be just a picture that I'm looking at here that it, it doesn't really translate very well. But they do speak about the photography having gotten better, so you don't need to be as you you don't need to have as big a contrast as you did earlier in earlier editions. So uh, lovely miniature to the Howda. I still don't know how a dragon would fit in with the Tomb Kings. I think a crocodile or something like that would be a lot better fit, but. Um, yeah, let's let's see. Uh, I really do hope he doesn't have fly in the rules because I don't see how something like this could fly uh, ever without having flaps on the wings uh, with just bones. So, again, if you want more about this painting article, go take a look at the uh, links in the description. Then we get another old world almanac. What exactly is an arcane journal? Well, I'm glad you asked, because that's the question that they are going to answer. Each faction gets its own arcane journal, and it contains supplementary background and imagery, and additional rules that complement these details through extra equipment, special characters, and army lists. So I guess we don't get special characters in Forces of Fantasy and Ravening Hordes, but we do get them in these arcane journals. So here we have some pages, what to expect, something about the, the colors, the heraldry, the Bretonian uniform, some background information. Uh, they also provide different ways to play and new ways to build your force via themed army lists with their own mustering rules. These armies of infamy differ from the main list in meaningful ways due to their geographical location, the unique tactics employed by certain generals, or the formation of historical retinues for notable characters. So that, I guess, means that special characters get their own uh, specific army lists, such as what you had in 6th edition. If you took Cetra, you had to make sure that at least half your army consisted of, and I'm saying this off the top of my head, chariots, heavy cavalry, and tomb guard. We also see here um, a 
specific type of uh, force for the Bretonians, the exiles. They are under command of a banished lord and they have taken up a vow of exile. It's a chivalrous vow and this has the stubborn and veteran special rules. And this model does not have to make a panic test for an, a friendly unit uh, with either the levies or peasantry special rule is deployed whilst within six inch of it is destroyed whilst within six inch of it. Wow, I can't even read anymore. Moment is fled through by a friendly unit with either of those rules. Uh, Tomb Kings can also have their rules in the own Arcane Journal. They can have the Nehekaran Royal Hosts and the Elite Retinue of an Influential Tomb Prince or Tomb King. And if you have this army, then they have some variant special rules, such as this one, Grind Them Down. Whilst within the General's Command Range, friendly models whose troop type is Chariot may re-roll the dice when rolling to determine the number of impact hits they cause. Arcane Journals also have historical recreation scenarios, uh, one at least in each. The Battle of Matorea for the Bretonians. And they give you here a link to that battle uh, with a download button. So if you click on this one, it will take you to a PDF. Hopefully, if it loads, with the Battle of Matorea. Uh, Pretty much in a 6th edition rulebook style, if I see it like this. Where you have the, the battlefield um, and the yeah historical recreation, the historical refight of this battle and of how this works. They end this article by saying that the battle report we saw mentioned earlier is also for free on YouTube. I haven't watched it yet and I think I'm going to uh, not watch it. Not that I'm not interested, but I'd like to read the rules beforehand to see, uh, to be able to follow what happens and then watch the battle report. Um, even when I do that, I don't think I'm going to make a separate video on that, commenting on that, because I'd rather make a video playing a old world battle and seeing for myself how this works. Then we get another Old World Almanac. Um, this is not a designer table, but this is a uh, sort of yeah tip how to bulk out your regiment with unit fillers. Unit fillers are one of those things that people either love or hate, or some people love to hate. Uh, personally, I don't really care much for unit fillers. I'd uh, rather just put more miniatures in there. I think that looks better than having a static objects uh, move around with your unit although some of those unit fillers can look really great in a unit and it gives you a it can give your unit a very nice thematic approach so uh, i i do use unit fillers in some units most notably in my zombie pirates but that's mostly because some of the zombies i made for that list they were painting challenge projects and as such, they have bigger bases because there was a little story I wanted to tell with each of them. So uh, that's a little bit of background on my history with unit fillers. In case you want to use them, you can find some tips in this article. Um, they show you a lovely... Nehekaran obelisk that is uh, magically taken along I guess there's some uh, magic happening there I don't know where this is from um, this is uh, let's see oh the, it was the basis of this was an Ossiarch bone reapers bone tithe nexus which probably is a thing uh, bone reapers have an aesthetic that is not totally dissimilar from the tomb kings so you can use that. And for a Bretonian unit filler, they have here a card with some shields and a chest on there. And uh, this is, uh, let's see, with parts of another conversion, two wheels, an excellent platform, and a couple of wooden struts from the Skaven Plague Furnace. So um, 
yeah, if you uh, want to recreate this, they give you some tips. And there's also plenty of other things you can do to make your own unit fillers, plenty of stuff on YouTube for that. Then the final round table, design round table, the past and future of a stone cold classic. I believe this is the last one in this series. Might be the last one so far, but I believe this is the last one in the series uh, period. How long was the game uh, under development? Ideas get tossed around all the time, but it was probably five years ago when we felt able to sit down and really start talking about the game. It was in uh, November 2019, I remember, because it was uh, about a week before my oldest daughter was born that they announced the return to the old world with that uh, very early at uh, all things come around even squares and then after pretty much right after that COVID hit and everything got delayed so yeah they've, they've been um, working on that ever since and we've been drip fed some things and uh, some some plans also tying it in with Total War Warhammer 3 with uh, Cathay and Kislev, but uh, those plans, I guess, have been shelved uh, or maybe discontinued altogether. And uh, they're going to focus now on these legacy, uh, no, not legacy armies, but these core faction armies only. So uh, it's built as a new game rather than a continuation of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. What does this mean? They say that it's not so much because it's a new game, but it's mostly because it's in a different time period. So um, this is uh, what we've heard before. The Warhammer the Old World and Horus Heresy are pretty much what they are to their main games. So uh, the Old World is the Horus Heresy of Warhammer Fantasy. Um, you spend a long time hunting through the Warhammer archives, warehouses and hidden corners of the factory, which treasures are returning. Loads of stuff is coming back, mostly made to order. Um, sometimes we get some things that are retooled and recast as Forge World Resin. Glad to hear that. No fine cast, I guess, still here. Uh, spent ages in the archive searching for classic heavy metal models and the production guys worked on getting the old molds and tools out of the mod balls. Lots of cutting uh, new molds and polishing the old tools, but it's not old stock. None of the models we're releasing were found on a pallet, so it's all new stuff that we get here. So how will these rarities be made available? Some collectible metal models and oddities from the history of Warhammer Fantasy Battle will be available on a made-to-order basis. And everything you accept to be representing unit profiles will be available normally. So look out for those made-to-orders if you want some stuff that we uh, should be getting as well. Have you, how have you blended the new with the old? This is what I mentioned earlier. The old armies were quite flat. Lots of troops at the same height. Monsters were kept smaller on purpose. So that's what they did now. They made the monsters a little bit bigger. Although, as you can see in this picture, there was not much of that flatness around because the uh, Necrosphinx was already part of the 8th edition kit, as were the Sepulchral Stalkers. Um, yeah, the Bone Dragon is, is definitely a lot higher with that Howda and that Palanquin on top, that, that uh, uh, little canopy over there. But other than that, I don't really see much... Uh, what they add so unless you get this new bone dragon you don't you still don't really get that much height difference and uh, same goes for the bretonians um what about legacy factions this is an important one some of the factions will not feature in the game of warhammer but uh, this is in terms of game rules model ranges and the ongoing background narrative so these are basically all written out Legacy Factions will get free downloadable army lists so people can try out a new gaming system with their older model collections. More about this in the coming weeks, so I'm sure to report on that by that time. Please note that they won't be considered legal for tournaments and won't receive ongoing support. That's a bit odd for them to say, because in an earlier article they mentioned that 
uh, demons would feature during the Great War Against Chaos. Now, this might be that the Great War Against Chaos won't, is, is not planned to happen until maybe the second edition of Warhammer the Old World, if we ever get there. But uh, yeah, we, we can expect to see demons return in great numbers during the Great War Against Chaos. As for the other factions, even though um, they don't really have much influence in the old world in this day, Dark Elves and Lizardmen would still be active during this time. Skaven would be underground fighting their own civil war. Uh, Ogres would probably still be running around somewhere and be available for hire. Even though the Vampire Counts have gone more or less into hiding, uh, you still get the occasional necromancer or vampire that's not a big named von Karstein lord. So I really don't see why they should exclude these armies from tournaments and thereby alienating about half their potential fan base. Not mentioning Chaos Dwarfs here, because Chaos Dwarfs, they didn't really get much attention in 4th edition. Not many people wanted to play them, only uh, afterwards that they got a little bit more love. And then in 8th edition they returned as a Forge World faction and was still pretty much out of reach for most people. So, uh, yeah, these other armies, and then even including the Chaos Dwarfs, uh, you've got nine regular armies, seven legacy armies, so about half of your fan base uh, you can reasonably assume as one of these seven as either their primary army or their only army. And you're alienating them by saying you're not allowed in tournaments with them and those legacy lists, we're not going to do much with them. So I, I think that's, even though they want to focus the narrative on the old world, I still think that excluding these is going to be uh, a big mistake. And uh, I've also seen people say after this article hit, uh, this is only going to be in official Games Workshop tournaments that those armies are not welcome, but in pretty much every other tournament that people are organizing for themselves or every other campaign or, or game day or whatever, those armies are still more than welcome. Um, so yeah, that's um, it's a bit surprising to say the least, especially since several of these miniatures you can still get from Games Workshop. The Ogres are still available, Skaven, uh, pretty much the whole range is still available, Lizardmen are still available. Uh, most of the Vampire Count stuff is available, Demons are all available. The only exceptions are the Dark Elves and the Chaos Dwarves. Uh, how important was mapping out these lands to the design process? So yeah, we got the map and we got it released uh, in, in bits of piece, bits and pieces. So um, uh, it, it was, uh, I guess, pretty important. Uh, there were multiple maps for each area in the old world. All of them designed to be con uh, contiguous eventually. It wasn't a simple process of just drawing a map. We had to work out how to find the middle ground between accuracy and details. Um, yeah, and then uh, different maps have been rendered with different areas with slight changes. So you had to reach a consensus on where the cities need to be placed for accuracy. Comparing Warmer Fantasy Roleplay and other maps with the work that we've done in creating the world map for the Total War Warhammer series. Any final thoughts? Um, it's weird to think that we've been working on this capacity in some capacity for so long. Yeah, I guess that uh, I, I think that they probably wanted to put this out a lot sooner, probably in the 40th anniversary year of Warhammer, which was last year. Um, it's strange being, bringing back an old game and old ranges that people know and love, and it wasn't simple. We had to dive into the archive, retrieve old models, rework things. Yeah, I guess that's going to be a big job indeed. And I certainly hope that they will do this game justice. From what I've seen so far, I'm pretty hopeful that this is going to be a fun game and that you will definitely get into the spirit of Warhammer with some new rules. So each edition had its own variants of rules or new additional rules, rules clarifications. 
Um, so let's just see how this will go when the books arrive and definitely keep an eye on this YouTube channel because I will be sure to post my own findings of that on here and I will also mention it on the Forces of Fantasy podcast of course. That's going to be it for this video. If you want to keep notified for when new videos drop, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Also leave a like on this video if you like the video, of course. I would also like to take this moment to thank my patrons. The Forces of Fantasy patron is non-tiered, meaning that you can join for as little or as much as you like each month. And on the patron, you can find exclusive bonus content. Forces of Fantasy is primarily a podcast where I discuss all things Warhammer Fantasy and then some. So if you want to know more about that, about the history of Warhammer Fantasy Battles starting all the way back in 1st edition, then I would like to invite you to give the podcast a listen. You can find the Forces of Fantasy podcast on any of your regular podcast hosting platforms. That's going to be it for now. Thank you very much for watching. And I will see you on the next video.